I feel like, you know, we're seeing what coronavirus is doing to the world, yeah. right? Um, and how, you know, journalism is now saying, how is Africa able to overcome this? Like how, you know, they're meant to be lying on the street dead. This is showing That's you, good, man. and I say this, I feel like Africa will be the place that everybody will go back home to. Thank you. Hey, what's going on, people? I go by the name of Adrian Daniels. If this is your first time listening, welcome. Uh, you're now tuned in to the Sound of a Crowd podcast. This is the show where we chat with colorful creatives and entrepreneurs from a Ghanaian background all have a special interest to the city of Accra or Ghana, bringing you one step closer to Accra. Now on today's show, we have the lovely Mika Abraham, and we're going to talk about her successful career to date, and we're going to talk about what she's got up to in Ghana, and also we're going to talk about what plans she has in the pipeline in the future, and so much more. She is a creative curator, a journalist, and a host. Now for today's episode, make sure you head over to the soundofacrowd.com forward slash Mika. So that's M-I-K-A to get all the show notes, which I've been prepared for you, including the key references, the links and the resources waiting for you to access and enjoy. Now, having said that, make sure you subscribe, whether you listen to this on the podcast, um, whether you listen to this on YouTube, etc. Subscribe, hit, hit that like button, leave a review for us if you listen to this on Apple Podcasts, share, share the words, let us know what you think and uh, enjoy the episode. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You're now tuned in to the sound of Accra. Um, you already know this is the show where we chat with colourful creatives and entrepreneurs from a Ghanaian background, all of a special interest to the city, uh, bringing you one step closer to Accra, wherever you are. Uh, today we got Mika in the studio. What's up, Mika? Hello, hello, hello. I really like that intro. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yeah, this is a little story, actually. The first time I, the first episode I did, mm. and I shared it with one of these, uh, um, these Ghanaian WhatsApp groups that I'm in, my young Ghanaian professional community. Yeah. The first comment I had that 20 second, 10 second, whatever intro was the reason why I'm still listening to that episode. Uh. Ah. So basically the intro, basically the hook just basically gave the person a reason to listen to it. No, it was a really good intro. Yeah. And I actually came up with the intro the day I was filming my first episode as well. So I had to think of something. I was like, I need like a theme around this podcast. And this is, that's what came up. So yeah i it's like been, it I yeah like it. thank really you cool. so much thanks <laughs> thanks so much so how are you doing i'm good thank you so much for having me yeah yeah i've heard so much about you so i thought you know what, let's let's get mika on the show i mean i had a friend or two you know said mention that you know mika should come on the show so i thought hey why not why not get her in and you know you great you gracefully uh responded to my email very swiftly so i really appreciate you for that no thank you it's an honor it's an honor <laughs> awesome excellent so um <laughs> I mean, I don't really know how to p- put you in a box. I mean, mm-hmm. there's so much that you do. I mean, in terms of cre- creativity. Yeah. I mean, you, you're, jur- you, you're, you're a journalist here. You're a creative curator there. Yeah. Um, social media, etc. I mean, there's so much. There's so much that you do, and uh, and it's hard to kind of put you in a box. But we're gonna get to your intro very, very shortly as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Um, so this, so guys, um, if you don't know Mika, uh, Mika Abraham is a trusted voice in the African music industry as well as the creative arts industry. She uses her passion, experience, and engagement to constantly empower African creatives and African diasporans. She is a well-respected broadcast journalist and host who is recognized both nationally and internationally for her work and public appearances. Her great work ethic landed her awarding opportunities to work with amazing brands such as MTV, Live Nation, BBC, Apple Music, British Council and so much more. As someone who is pioneering through the creative industry, Mika Abraham unifies and bridges the gap between Africa and the Western world and is on the radar as a pioneer of creative phenomenon status. Wow. That's wow, isn't it? <laughs> that is wow, isn't it? <laughs> That's wow. I'm like, who is this person? I know, you just sounds so accomplished. So yeah, we're deaf. So guys, we're gonna get into all of this and just just so that you guys remember for the show notes today. Head over to the soundofacrowd.com. That's the soundofacrowd.com. We're gonna have all of the um the key references and the, the links for you to to grab so that you don't have to listen and write everything down. <laughs> okay, Mika, <laughs> that was a handful. So um yeah, let's let's get straight into it. So mm-hmm. um 
Yeah. Um. So just just give the audience a little bit of a brief background. I mean, I've just kind of given them a bio. Yeah. Just just from your perspective, just a quick kind of background into your life and and and, and what have you been up to recently as well? That'd be good to know. Yeah. In this so COVID world. In this COVID world. I know, right? <laughs> um. So essentially, I started off when I was fifteen. Yeah. Um. And I started off on radio. So that's basically I would say that's my main thing. Mm. Um. So started off on radio. Um was doing like the local stuff and from East London. So at the time mm. grime was picking up and mm -hmm. everything else like that. But um, it was a thing for me where I decided that, you know, I want to go into radio. Um, this is my thing. It's my, like, even from secondary school, my yeah. teachers were like, you have this voice, you know, <laughs> when you do drama, you're doing like voice, um, voice acting or whatever it's called. I can't remember what it's called, but uh -huh. like, so they were like, go into something that's got to do with voicing or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, cool. So, um, in my area during summer holidays, my mum was like, oh, there's a radio thing that they're doing in Stratford. Why not go and do it? Um, and they were like, okay, we have to create a project. Mm. And my project was based around grime music. Okay. Um, so I did this whole entire one hour radio show based on grime music, who wow. the artists were and what they, and like their songs and yeah. why Newham was responsible for the grime and da, 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 da. Um, and that ended up winning. And wow. this show basically was aired um, in front of like the mayor of Newham and they recognised it and all that mm. stuff. So yeah. So then after, Newham, that's big. yeah, at the time <laughs> it's big now. I'm just I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm, something I'm something something that's, that's, that's fantastic <laughs> thank you um but then when i turned 17 so there's a radio station called rinse so are we allowed to say am i allowed to say names here yeah yeah I'm yeah not, okay cool <laughs> um, so there's a radio station called rinse fm um okay. I've heard of them. Uh, yes. Rinse FM at the time when I started, it didn't have a license. It was a pirate radio station. Yeah. Um, so I, the DJ that I went on the show with, he was basically like, look, I'm going to get the audience to, to choose if you can stay or not. Okay. Um, so it was basically like a trial and he went deciding it was the audience. So we had the whole show um, and the people said I should stay. So I was on that show from 17 to 21. Mm. Yeah. Um, even during the time when they got their license. So, um, I'm doing this while I'm in college, you know, <laughs> going to college. And it was a morning show. So I was okay. doing it from six to 10, then from 10, go to college, come back, do the same thing like every day, five days a week. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a problem with doing that because I loved music and radio so much more. Mm. Um, and that 21, I think, because I was doing it for so long, yeah. I needed a kind of like, do you know what? I need to find myself again. I've been so immersed into this thing and now the radio show is ending. Yeah. I need to kind of figure out who I am and what I'm meant okay. to, to be doing. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind, I come from a very political journalistic education based family. Mm. So I decided that I weren't going to go to radio cause I was already work. I'm not radio. So university, cause I was already working in the field that I wanted to get into. So I was already doing stuff with BBC after that and wow. choice FM after that at the time. <laughs> Um, what, what is it called again? Is capital capital Extra now, capital yeah. Extra. So I was already doing stuff with them. So I'd been, I was a very active person from secondary school. Yeah. Um, and then from when I turned, I think I was 20, no, yeah, 20, went to Ghana and I was bored during summer holidays. And then I went to go and do a radio um, work experience for six weeks. Okay, so it's been a while since you've been kind of going to Ghana. Yeah, it's so like it's not just now. I've been, it, I've been going, but when I was 21, I kind of made that decision that I want to see yeah. something, you know. Um, I mean, you can go to Ghana and have fun and party all the time, but yeah. I feel like there's so much more to it and I just wanted Thank to explore you. that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Honestly. <Yeah. laughs> um, I mean, you can party till kingdom come, but it's just like, <laughs> you're going to get bored at one point. You, mm. You'll begin to see the, the cracks in between certain things and want to know how can I be a part of building this back again Absolutely. um so went to ghana and then ended up staying uh -huh. at the radio station for six weeks mm. and the manager said basically how would you feel about actually coming and contributing to to our station okay. but i was just like oh moving to ghana i don't, I don't know about that <laughs> that's a bit much um yeah. but then from there i came back to london uh -huh. and then i decided that you know what there's an afro music scene in ghana that and there's creatives there that no one really knows about how do people not know about these creatives that are based in ghana yeah. i mean you go to certain places like republic and uh -huh. osu or you go to just different areas that i was going to and i was meeting so many different creative friends so many so many and i was my thing was is like how do people not know about you i come from a city where you know we have funding we have arts council we have all these things that are so invested in the creative arts why don't we have the same thing over here yeah. you know with art playing a very big part in how society comes you know how people come to africa in, in general very true 
why is it not invested into so this was something that i started looking into more yeah. i came back to london ended up going back onto another radio station wow. um represent and i was there for two years and okay. then represent represent yeah represent. <laughs> <laughs> um and then so my thing was you know what i want to move to africa but it wasn't ghana that i was trying to move to i was trying to move to south africa because okay. i wanted to see if i could bring an mtv base to mm. ghana i wanted to see how we could get an office there true because there know? was mtv base in south africa wasn't yes it? so it's you have mtv base in south africa and nigeria and if you're looking at it from the music background yeah. um even in between all the stuff i was doing at radio i was yeah, working yeah. with musicians as well so i was doing marketing i was working with labels um so i think that's how i gained a lot of my networks but it was the thing of i want to see how i could move to south africa and be a part of this you know new sort of thing everyone's catching on to Afrobeats and we've been pushing it for a very long time so let's make it proper now and then randomly by favor my friend I met him at a Google party and he was just like you know uh, I was just telling him I'm ready to move to South Africa I want to move to MT I want to go and work with MTU base and he was like why would you go and move to South Africa when you can just work at MTV here okay and I'll just give you a column and I was like, what? Oh, wow. So that's that's how the um, column... column. Yeah, so that's how it starts. starts. So essentially, yeah. I would say that the whole focus on Africa, Africa, African music and African creatives started. Okay. I mean, the radio background is there, but I would say from the day that MTV gave me that column, yeah. um, that was the starting point for, for so many doors, but it opened up my eyes to a lot of things. Mm. So um, I was just in awe because... MTV don't necessarily just give you a column like that. Yeah. And first of all, if they're giving you a column, it's going to be named what they want it to be. Um, and he was just like, no, you, this is your column. You can do whatever you want with it. Really? We need somebody to write about African music. Wow. You're the best person for it. See, I'm telling you, it's not it's not what you know, it's who you know sometimes, it's, right? It is sometimes who you know as well. But for me, I've always been true to my word and what I speak about. I've yeah. always been passionate about African music. Mm. You know, being Ghanaian, we love our hall parties. We love all these different <laughs> things. So I kind of wanted people to see around me that everything I'm talking on Twitter is not gibberish. Like there is a scene here, you know? Mm. Um, so with MTV, that gave me the opportunity to put so many, you know, Ghanaians and Nigerians on there, people who've never even had the chance to go and okay. do all these different things. So I essentially became like the the main person for everything Afrobeats in terms of the UK. Wow, that's big. Yeah, it was big. I didn't know the workload was going to be a lot though. Was it was it like a full time? Was it like a full time kind of thing or was um, it part time? Was it ad hoc? How was it? Like? It was. It was full time okay. in a way because obviously I'm writing, so I'm but I'm doing a lot of like the journalism too. So I'm having to transcribe, I'm having to go and do the interviews, I'm having to go to listening parties. Okay. I mean, I mean it seems it's fun. Bit, yeah. yeah, it seems fun, but sometimes it does get a lot because the, there's you've now become the center for MTV UK. I mean, MTV Africa is good, yeah. but there are African artists who are already on there. They're now trying to reach out to Europe and the UK. Yeah, so true. we are trying to get on MTV UK and you're the only person that can put us on this platform. Wow. So um, I kind of became that go-to person And the first people that I had up on there was mm -hmm. composers Okay, composers Bad. And it's so random How would And someone says to me, why would you put composers there? They're not artists But I was like, if you've been to their shows right. um, In their own right, yeah. they've carved out their lane <laughs> They've literally carved out their lane And for me, again, as I said I wanted to use that opportunity Not just to put people on there who already had a name I yeah. wanted it to be a case where people Who hadn't seen these people will go up and be like Oh, who are they? And want to go and follow them That's it, yeah Yeah, so um, And then after that, my second interview My first official interview with a celebrity Celebrity, if you want to say, was Burner Boy mm. um, Okay. That one was very nerve wracking. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to cancel the interview. Was but he big at the time, or just he was making his way? He was big at the time. This is, in fact, he hadn't been to London in in seven years. Wow. So this was his comeback show. Okay. So you know everybody knows Burner Boy, but yeah. you know not like he wasn't as popular as he is now, yeah. but. Yeah, there was like a press conference and I was just so nervous. I was like, I didn't prepare myself in, but it was a really good interview. To, you weren't used to, to that kind of interaction, that level of interaction as well, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I'm a presenter, so I it's normal. But mm. I think for me, you know, when you watch other journalistic interviews on YouTube and you yeah. kind of just see the mannerisms of the artist and you're like, oh man, he doesn't like interviews. <laughs> so am I going to really sit down and how am I going to entertain this guy and how yeah. am I going to, you know, but... um this is what kind of carved out the way that I conducted my interviews where I never, I had a very, 
it was more based on conversation than it was mm. just me asking them questions. Okay. So I wanted it to be very, you know, I just wanted it to be to be like flowy in a sense. <laughs> I didn't want it to be like, oh, I'm asking them questions about their personal life. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the music. I've always been focused on music. So I wanted to to take them to a place where they would have to remember what made them go into it. And then, then you know, if they're open, most of the time they would just go off and go on a tangent and have that conversation. But that wow. again is one of the things that worked in my favor was just like, let's just have a conversation. Wow. No pressure. Okay talk what you want to talk if you don't want to talk we don't have to talk it's, yeah. it's that sort of thing but yeah um and i'll say this is uh, i think this interview at the shatawale one mm. was the one that set it all off for me wow so yeah shatawale man from <laughs> ghana i know some people in it yeah i was so excited about putting him into mtv because i remember i was watching him on instagram and he was saying something i was like no i need to get him and that was before you collaborated with Beyonce and all these other That was things, before. Right? Okay. So for me, seeing what he's done with Beyonce kind of just yeah. covers back to what we were speaking about in the interview. Mm. And funny enough, the other day, I think it was like an anniversary. Uh, like it was like, it came, you know, it comes up on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and he was asking me, oh, do you still have the interview? Oh, wow. Okay. Because there were a lot of things. And I realized all the conversations I have, a lot of the artists, what they said then, maybe like two, three years ago, yeah. they're actually doing it now. Mr. Easy, he said he wanted to be on a bus and he wanted to put out these different things. He ended up on a bus and, you know, everything that he's doing now, he's actually doing. So mm. to be a part of those journeys. But Shatawale's one. About to say. Yeah. yeah. Shatawale's one was more closer to home because he's from Ghana. He's, you know, he at the time he just sold out Indigo to like completely in and that was a big deal you know not yeah. no Ghanaian artist has been able to sell it at that capacity that wow. he did wow. um so for us to be able to capture that mm. in essence essentially was the one that kind of pushed us to the forefront and everyone was like started looking at Afro district in a different way the column um and then yeah so from there that's where we move it's a lot that's a lot that's a lot so basically like you know you you, you were brought in to to do all these different columns and mm -hmm. as a result you know you've, you've had the chance to meet and speak to all these different artists but for you obviously what was powerful is that you had free reign to, mm -hmm. to, to you know to manage that column however you wanted to do yeah but then you also wanted to kind of focus on trying to bring through artists that weren't necessarily uh big already yeah or maybe necessarily didn't have a certain exposure to a certain region mm -hmm. that's really really powerful and i'm sure you must be kind of you must kind of feel good about yourself looking back and seeing all of these artists that are now kind of blown up where before they went, you know, where yeah. they are now. And I mean, that must really kind of give you even more credibility to what you do today. And, and maybe it must also impact the, um, the connections and the opportunities that you're getting today as well. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, definitely. I think essentially I, I truly believe that when you've been given a position yeah. of that caliber, not anybody just kind of gets a position like that with MTV. I mean, we used to watch this thing on TV. Mm. You know, it was everyone's dream who was a presenter to want to go and present on MTV or host MTV or DJ or whatever it is. Yeah. So for me, whereas and I said again, my focus was how can I put African artists on the map? Mm -hmm. You know, there's people that have done it before. So I had to make myself different. Yeah. If it's the case where I'm putting certain people who wouldn't be able to get that platform on a regular day, I'm going to do that. Because it weren't just about the celebrities. I put people who were even local in Nigeria that even people in Nigeria hadn't heard of yet. Yeah. But they were talented. Uh -huh. So my thing was, I want to showcase the talent. I want people to understand it's not just about the status that you have, but in Africa, we have so much from those who are known to those who are underground. Like mm. if we're going to be true people about yeah. music, let's, let's get everything, you know? Everything, yeah. So, um, yeah, that I, I went for it all. I did not <laughs> hold back. I put people on there from, you know, um, Jay Holland. I put people like Quams and, um, Quams and Flavor, Mr. Okay. Silva. Okay. Um, who else? I put, I can't remember the female that I put on there, but <laughs> I, I remember, I can't remember, because she was an underground artist at the time as well. Yeah. But I just put a lot of people, I was just like, do you know what? This platform is for us. Powerful. Um, yeah. So let's, let's go. Okay. And this is, this is just a off the cuff question. If, do you feel like if someone else was, was running your column, there would just kind of be kind of um, average, like they'll just kind of interview people that are already kind of known and, you know just already have some kind of platform of course because yeah. it's like it it doesn't matter what caliber of people mtv i had so many people asking me i, I had the chance to interview david o Wizkid, mm. jadena i actually interviewed jadena um okay. 
but he's in Ghana. He's, he loves coming to Ghana. He so loves he coming to Ghana. And even when we'll we did the that. interview, he was like, oh, you're Ghanaian? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. But it's just like, yeah, they you have you have the capacity. Everybody you have to understand. That everybody's at your in your emails, mm. in your inbox. Can you oh can you can you interview this person or can you do this? Can you do that? Sometimes you have to decline certain people because it's like it has to make sense. Mm. I don't ever want to be the person that was like didn't give somebody opportunity because somebody else was in a higher position. You can get interviewed by MTV anytime, any day. True. But at this one moment in time, I want to be able to say that I'm gonna write about this artist and really get to understand the nitty gritty of where their music is coming from. Mm. Um, so that was even from like, you know, the old taste scene that we're seeing now. Yeah. I, w- I wrote about it um, with the artist and we were talking about, it and it's so random <laughs> that now it's just like properly, it's really f- like coming to fruition. Mm. So for me, I c- I'm able to go back and see those things and look at the, and, you know, being so young and being able to do those things as well, you'll think that will kind of get to your head. It actually humbled me. (laughs) It humbled me to the core because I'm like, yo, this is a position that you've been blessed with. Mm. And there are people who are like, thank you so much. For even Shatawale was the one that shocked me as well. He kept on thanking me. I was like, yo, I'm sitting here in front of Shatawale. Like I'm a fan. He's grateful. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I mean, you get some artists that are cocky and you get some artists that are somewhat grateful yeah like that. i mean it's quite surprising mm, very so it was a fun time okay and uh, and the column was it um was it online base was it was it like a magazine like where were people see, where were people seeing the, the column where were they able to see it so it was online online no. so that would be much more easier i could okay. ship it to amsterdam i could ship it to ghana i could send it to nigeria of course it was all online okay so like the mtv websites so people all over the world were able to people were all over the world were able to re- wow. access it um and even got to the point where people from certain blogs will now take my pieces and post them up. <laughs> <laughs> How does that make you feel? I, I mean, I didn't know because it was my mum that noticed it at first. She was like, ah, you know that the, the, the column that you wrote for Shatawali is on Ghana Webdoll. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <Really>? what? <laughs> I was like, how? Um, but then journalists in Ghana started actually reaching out to me for okay. certain artists and just wanted me to do like a little blurb to send to them so they can post it up and say, that, okay, they got covered by MTV. Because um, I think I was tired of seeing the negativity that some of the Ghana, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say it, but <laughs> Ghana journalists were were portraying. I mean, you have artists that come over here and they kill it, and then the next thing you know, when you look on the Ghana blogs, there's something completely different to what actually happened. Mm. You know, oh. so it's more so negative than more so positive that we've seen over here. So for me, it was like I want to be able to change that, and this is what actually happened, and change you, yeah, change the narrative essentially. So yeah, wow, it's powerful. So. Um, I guess I guess you having these opportunities and using them in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's what kind of opened door for things like homecoming. GHC. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's 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 segue into that. So um, I know was it was this was it is it a one was it a one time event or is it on, is it an ongoing thing this this homecoming? So homecoming, the plan was, and this was even last year. So mm. the the plan was. If, wait, even before Homecoming, yeah. there's this thing that I did in 2018 called Creative Connect. Okay. So Creative. before that, I actually wanted to bring creatives together, but I wanted to have a deeper understanding because what happens is us that are in the diaspora, we tend to go over to Ghana and we want to be uh, the saviour. <laughs> you know, um, they say that we have this savior complex. So I was like, you know what? I want to have an understanding of what this industry needs. Cause I feel like in order for you to change the system, you have to understand the system. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to be like, okay, cool. I'm going to yeah. say, say that one more time. In order for you to change the system, you have to understand the system. So I stayed out there for three months. Uh-huh. Um, I wanted to be, I wanted to understand okay. what it was like to be like a creative out there in, you Ghana, know, yeah. in Ghana. Three months. Um, wow. Three months. I was working Location. with different creatives, um, understanding the job roles, seeing how difficult it was for them uh-huh. financially. Oh yeah. Um, just it, do you know, and one thing it was inspirational because yeah. you're so hungry to the point where this is all I have to do. So it made me even more hungry as a creative. You know, again, I do so many things, but I, I kind of find it difficult sometimes to even navigate the amount of stuff that I do. Yeah. So for me, it was able. I was able to kind of understand where my role was, um, whether it's me being a helper to them or whether yeah. it's me creating something for them. Okay. But um, 
So I put Creative um, Creative Connect together and essentially it was meant to be an agency where what I'll do is I have a lot of opportunities that people ask me about and I was like, okay, cool. I have a, a list of people that do certain things based in Ghana okay. and I will give them the opportunity. So what it is, is they'll be getting the same amount of money as if a creative over here will be getting. Okay. So oh. someone's playing a graphic like design, trade kind of basically, <laughs> but essentially I'm not making the money. I didn't really care for that. I just wanted them to get the opportunities. Um, so I set up an event and I had so many creatives come and we had, a, a creative panel that was mixed with diasporans and those based in Ghana. Mm-hmm. And I said to the creators based in Ghana, this is your free reign to actually say how you feel and what you need. And then people were just saying what they were saying. Some were positive, wow. some were negative, but I understood it because they were like, you guys come and sometimes you, you, you take our skills and you don't really kind of like, you make it seem as if we're wrong all the time that we don't know about the business, that we don't know about creativity and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I was like, the whole point of this thing is, is not for us to tell you what you're doing wrong, it's for us to share skills. Because there's still things that we don't know as those who are based in London. I think this perception is that because we're based in the UK, yeah. that as creatives, we don't go through our creative lows. We don't go through the places where we don't have money or we don't have those things to support us, okay. you know? Um, yeah. And it was just kind of bringing a mutual understanding so from that conversation that we had Uh um within that year i was like you know what i had done something with british council before like a a a swap where you know we had five creators from the uk go over there and work with creators based in ghana and then we created like okay it was it was just really good it was something to do with like like an exchange an exchange program exactly what that was (laughs) um and i was just excited because that's when i was like i met so many different type of level creatives Mm. and then homecoming came and i was like you know what if I'm going to partner up with any company, it would have to be British Council just yeah. because of what I experienced working with them. And for them, it's like being the middle ground because they don't have access to the people that are really under the scene like that. Okay, elaborate more on that. So obviously, you know, in Ghana, if you're from the, the streets of the hood, you know the creators, creators, you know. Yeah. Um, and if, if we're in a position like British Council, you may not know okay. that reach exactly. Grassroots. The yeah. grassroots, there we go. So I wanted to kind of be like the middleman that could okay. connect it. So essentially Homecoming came with a friend called Kojo, shout out to Kojo. And we were like, okay, cool. Let's um, let's organize something. And they had a project that they wanted to do. And they were like, okay, cool. We've got this budget. It kind of essentially aligned with what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And we put it together and made it homecoming. So it was in the year of return. Okay. And we wanted to plan it like, okay, cool. People have come to Ghana. You've okay. year of return, you're homecoming. <laughs> and, you know, it made sense. Um, but we put on seminars. We did like a travel trip from Accra to Kamasi via bus. And they had to create things on the bus. And then when we got to Kamasi, they, you know, toured the Mensha Palace. But essentially it was just kind of gaining more knowledge and just... Um, even though not everybody was a creative on the bus, but yeah. there was different things that we needed to learn from each other, you know, okay. financially, tech wise, okay. you know, you even had school teachers. And then we went over to an orphanage where we actually did a lot of creative activities with the kids. Okay. So um, it was like a workshop kind of thing. It was a workshop. Yeah. Wow. And then we had the seminar, which was based at the British Council um, main space. And yeah, we had really, really good feedback from that. And, you know, a lot of people are asking when, when we're going to do that again, COVID, (laughs) (laughs) Corona. (laughs) But um, that for me has got to be something that, again, my main purpose of doing that was you can enjoy yourself, you can have fun. But the difference is why come and just have fun and go back home when you can actually be a part of making a difference? You know, <sighs> this is the this is the the common thing that's that's spoken about. I mean, I think the year return was mm-hmm. you know was an example of that of people coming from diaspora or abroad, mm. you know, coming to enjoy or coming to do a few things here and there, maybe leave a little bit of money or whatever, mm. and then just go back. Yeah, Not leave like a solid firm foundation, yeah. something you know, something of substance that's gonna last for years to come. Yeah, this is the this is the main issue. With oh, the, of course, kind of things. And I'm coming from a place of like, I'm seeing what a creative economy is doing for us in the UK. Yeah. I did a research and I found out how much certain countries make a year just from the creative arts industry. And I was like, how come I cannot monetize how much Ghana is making in a year from the creative arts industry when I'm seeing how hard these people work from our musicians mm. to our, to um, the performances, to theater, to every single thing that you can deem as art, they're making money from it. Whenever politicians need some sort of propaganda, it's an yeah. artist that is doing that for them. Yeah. When you go across the, when you're in Accra, who do you think is painting the, sh- the streets? Yeah. 
you know, who's de- who's decorating and doing all these amazing things that you see the artwork. When people yeah. come to Africa, it's not like they're coming to look at how green our grass is. <laughs> you know, they're coming to look at our arts, our culture, our heritage, our history. Um, and it's a shame that all those things are not invested into. So my main it's thing, yeah, it's a shame. And my main thing was how are we as Ghanaians going to sit down and create our own creative economy? I know how much this economy can, this, this industry that we have can make for the country. Yeah. You know, we can add value to it, but Absolutely. in order for you to add value, value into something something needs to be put into it so something can come out of it absolutely um i can totally agree with you i mean there's so much when you go to a crowd even ghana like there's so much creativity Mm. so much from from the artists that draw yeah um to art exhibitions um photo exhibition shout out to danny wonders shout out to danny i went to his exhibition last year um yeah i mean there's so much that we have i mean there's tech hubs i've been to a few tech hubs you know build relationships there's so much but Mm -hmm. how do you put all of this into one box and i think you're right i mean ghana should be investing they should have spotted opportunity and be investing into that side of the um of 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 of, of the um that sector yeah right but i mean they're more but the sad thing is that you know some of these people in the government i mean they're they're backwards minded or yeah. they're, not, they're not forward thinking I yeah. understand I think they need someone like you to, to get you know to be a part of, <laughs> of what they're doing or be a part of their budget and invest some money there because when people are coming to Ghana especially when it comes to tourism especially when it comes yep. to uh, things from abroad people from abroad you know I mean they're gonna I mean creativity is a big part of it I mean I'll go to festivals I'll go to yeah. events I'll go to concerts you mentioned composers mm-hmm. you know I'll, I was you know things like that you know I understand we need to kind of put, pump some money some finance into that it has to be done because essentially if you look at this you know what we're doing here today is art right there are young people who want to get into radio Mm. are there facilities for them to learn how to become a radio presenter to learn how to drive the desk or the board or to learn how to produce a show or to learn how to record all these different things so in my mind we have to look at now i always say this and i was having this conversation with my mom um because again, when it comes down to politics, mm-hmm. you could be very, you know, for one side or be very biased. Okay. You have to have audacity. And I would say this, when I speak in terms of creative arts, I'm very bold in what I say and I don't hold back because of, I see how creative arts can save a lot of people. Yeah. You know, we're in a generation where not everyone wants to be a doctor or a lawyer or a journalist in that sense, you know, not everyone wants to be, uh, you know, I don't know what other things they want us to be, but all those other things, <laughs> but there are, there are amazing young people, mm. gifted people, okay. you know, STEM is art, yeah. you know, technology is art. If we start embracing the young kids and teaching them now, imagine when they get to a certain age, what Ghana would be like, just because we invested in them, yeah. invested into the crafts of what they're trying to do, not Absolutely. forcing a, uh, uh, industry on them that they'll forever be under but showing them that they can have ownership within their craft and i think if we understand that we will know that okay as we're pushing gone and everyone's focusing on tourism tourism is amazing it's doing good i mean it's good so many new attractions it's it's so many new attractions but then people will get bored of tourism at some point yeah you know, it's the musicians that will be having the concerts. It's the theatres that the, the the actors are keeping open. You know, all these stadiums that you have is all the all these entertainers. I find it so sad that how we can look back and all those people that we watch or listen to when we were growing up, yeah. and then you know, twenty twenty, we're seeing a lot of them on Twitter creating a GoFundMe to pay for liver surgery. Can't believe it. You know, how come we don't have PRS or royalties that they can backlog onto that can help look after them throughout the years? So these are the things coming from a music background. I'm thinking about the musicians now. How much money are they really making from their music in Ghana? True. Very true. Who's buying their music? They don't have the infrastructure. Exactly. Don't they? Right. So when do we actually get to a place in time where we're actually saying we need to create an infrastructure? And I I would say to people that when you tell me, oh, you know, we've done, it, it won't work unless you've tried. And I'm not accepting that. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's something where we're so we're so reliant on the government to do these things. We're creatives. Mm-hmm. We don't the, the government doesn't come and create art for you. So you have to create these things for yourself. If you have yeah. to say that, look, we are providing this service. Yeah. This is what we're asking for. The day that people actually stand up and take a rise and actually understand that if you were just to say one thing or do one thing to advocate for this thing, or actually push for it as hard as you can, yeah. something will come off of it. Absolutely. But then if it's the case, and I always say that it may not be somebody who's based in Ghana to change the way that creative arts is seen. It may be someone from the diaspora, yeah. you know, um, 
but I understand the power of collaborations and bringing people in and trying to get people to see that, okay, there are people that are paying attention to Ghana. Mm. Apple was in Ghana with us last year. Yeah. You know, Audio me. Mac. Apple, um, so they're, they've they always been interested, you know, in African music, you know. Was that, were they connected with Live Nation and Afro Nation at all? No. It's completely different. Yeah, no, they're okay. completely different things. So with Live Nation, essentially what I was doing was, so when we have like, you know, you have people that work there. So it's almost like musical brand consultation. Okay. Um, you have people that work there and they're like, okay, we want to bring, uh, let's say a stone boy yeah. to London and we want to do a tour with him. Okay. Um, how, what size venue do you think he can fill up okay. or what size? So do you think he will make this amount of money on this tour? Who else do you think that we should work with? Okay. Those are so, that was my kind of plug in. Yeah, kind of like how Cardi B, but but that was kind of private, independent, how Cardi B came over and did right. thing. Right, yes, that was simple like that. Yeah. So, um, so stuff like that with Live Nation, essentially with Apple, my main thing was at the time I was trying to showcase, you guys are already doing this thing with Africa. Mr. Uh-huh. Easy's kind of like, you know, the the way that you guys are going through. There's other artists as well. You have a Joey B, you have a Lamem Gang, you have a King Promise, you have a Darko Vibes. Like, how can we create a vibe with this, this these people <laughs> over here? So I was like, look, come to Ghana, come and check it out and see what you like and see how you feel. And then from there, you're now beginning to see you have a lot of collaborations happening with Apple Music and African artists. You know, Cuppy's now just got a show on um, on on Apple Music now. So it took them so long. Apple Music, are, they need to catch up with Spotify. That's what I'm saying. On, do you know what? <laughs> it's so true. I'm loving, I'm loving what everyone's doing. I'm loving, I'm loving the interest for African music now on all sides of things. Um, I think it's about time. But then I feel like there's so much, we can go so much further, you know, Um, and it's all down to the education of how we run our businesses, how we kind of treat each other, how we support each other. Um, The, my main focus, I know that Nigeria kind of have it down some way, somehow, but Ghana, man, we just kind (laughs) of need to, we need to, I'm, I'm sitting in meetings every day and I'm speaking about these artists. I'm just like, I wish the artists could see how much people are fighting yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not their fault. It's just down to the way the infrastructure is and how, you know, things are back home. And so everyone assumed their positions and start fighting to get there. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so much we can talk about regarding that. How mm. would you, Mika, how would you approach, let's say you had access to funding. Mm. How would you, well, I'm sure you do, right? But I mean, if you had access to the right level of funding, how would you approach this this challenge of of the creative economy, building some kind of platform, some kind of infrastructure for them, whether it's online, mm-hmm. offline, or maybe some kind of hybrid platform? How would you approach it, like in like in the in the high level overview, quickly? So first things first, I always say that you have to take care of the younger generation first. Yeah. So my thing is, I've always wanted to create a creative hub. And this hub has to consist of everything creative wise in this one building. Mm -hmm. I want there to be a studio. I need there to be a rehearsal space. I need there to be a space for the fashionistas. I need there to be a space for for everybody that's deemed a creative, for them to have a place to go to. Um, Not a lot of creatives have that access, you know? So what you do is you have to create those accesses. They need to, and then even within that hub, you now start to educate people, Mm. building a portfolio. Because it all starts with education. You can't run a business if you don't know how to, you know? So, treating your bit treating the creatives as a treating treating no, sorry treating your art as if it's a business yeah. you know from the education side of it how to make money from it how to present yourself properly the right way to do this the right way to do that and when it comes down to funding in terms of artists mm-hmm. it will always have to go back to um how do we need to change around our system in terms of the royalty scheme mm-hmm. right that's a good point exactly cool. so put the funding aside how am i gonna rework this structure <laughs> what what do we do so we're going to have to bring people on we're going to have to get them to understand how monetization works yeah. or it's the case of we now start bringing labels to uh-huh. the country and now asking labels to start pumping money into these artists and then we can start to see the development and growth within these artists True. and then with funding as well if there's artists that are out there that are looking for funding then you actually help them because you can give this is the thing you can give a creative money but it doesn't mean that it will take them out of their situation thank you yeah the, they need the guidance they need they the still need exactly they still need all those things and holding all of that yeah all of that because i feel like essentially a lot of people are running on the face of the things of just doing it as you go yeah 
And then one thing, even as a creative base in London, we know that doing it as you go, you still make certain mistakes. So you have to learn from those things. But why have to, why do you have to go through that if someone can actually show you the best way to do it? Absolutely. So I can give you £50,000 today and you will spend that £50,000 without nothing to do with your art. Yeah. You probably buy a few things here and there. Of course, yeah, because there's also poverty. That's, that's Exactly. A, that's you can't change the mindset. Here's the thing. Yeah. If, if your mind is stuck in poverty if I give you that £50,000 it's still going to be stuck on poverty because you're going to go and use it to buy things that you don't need yeah. you're going to buy things that you want yeah. so essentially you're still going to be poor yeah absolutely so first things first the creative art, uh, arts industry needs a change of mindset mm -hmm. you need to be able to understand that I can do it I can actually make this work I can be global I don't like it when people feel like Ghana is where they're meant to stay and remain I always say this do you want to be a local star do you want to be a global champion and a lot of the times, Ghanaian artists or wherever, <laughs> we like to remain local champions. Yeah, again, it's the mentality, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, they don't want, they don't want to, um, they're not realizing that the sky's the limit thanks to the internet and, mm -hmm. you know, travel opportunities and things like that. You know, we can, they can expose themselves to a global audience. Yeah, you can reach out so much more. But for me, my main thing is in order for us to, again, it goes back to understand, to change the system, you have to understand it. And that's destroying and rebuilding and starting again. That's where your money will go into. And that's a big deal. It's like in anything, when a new president comes in and he has to stop what the other um, party was doing and rebuild from there, you know, rework everything that's been done. It's mm. the same way with the industry. The industry is so corrupt. It's It's been so against people for so long that people were so, there's no sort of positivity that they see. They don't see hope in it. Yeah. So you're now having to rebuild a structure to give people hope again. Yeah, and I think a big part of that is the mentality and yeah. the, the mentality poverty out in Africa and also um, greed as well. Yeah, so it's a big part of it. Yeah, so regardless or not of money, if you know how to use it properly, I'm telling you, you will make the money. But then again, no one's really thinking about okay, let's create a studio, let's build this, let's build that, so everybody has access to it. It's not just accessible to a certain type of people. Yeah. So for me, that's definitely something. It's, it's, it's going to be down to the mind and the facilities. Yeah. And then we're going to see the progress because we've invested in a new generation of artists, a new generation of technology, a new generation of things. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. And I think um, the creative arts industry needs to follow, you know, the same path of other industries like tech. You see mm -hmm. how, you see how, Google has set up um, premises in, yeah. you know, an AI lab in Ghana yeah. and things like that. I think they need to follow the same path as that, you know, just invest into the future mm -hmm. of Africa. Of course. It's, it's definitely bright, but, you know, it, it's a matter of who gets there first and who's also going to help these people and, you know, tap into these opportunities. Again, same thing with football. Um, I'm hearing there's some um, big football teams that have again invested into Ghana and, you know, trying to, you know, poach out talent from earlier on. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, the industry needs to follow the same steps to try and make something happen and invest, invest for the long term, not invest for the short term. Yeah. You, I would say this, a leader is not somebody who thinks about five years. They're thinking about the 10 years. So mm. as much as I can focus on people now, whatever we do today in terms of the creative arts industry is not going to be for us. Yeah, It's going to be for those who are coming in the next generation, the generation after that, you know, so it's going to have to be a lot of, sitting down rewrite because i feel like once you get to a certain age you're really stuck in your ways yeah. there's nothing i can say or do to you or for you that will make you feel like this is going to get any better you're just going to think this is how it is but there's a young person that's 10 years old or there's a young person that's 15 years old yeah, that's yeah, looking yeah. at a, a a king promise and wants to be the future king promise but yeah. doesn't understand what facilities he may have yeah. So we want to be able to provide all of this That's for them. That's a point. You want to get there early because it's yeah. hard to rewire. It's hard to rewire. Anybody for, in terms of anything, anything. any kind of habits. Yeah. yeah, it's a mindset thing. And I feel like once you change the mind and adjust the mind, you can create some very powerful, dangerous people. Very, very powerful. Wow. Uh, well, um, yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Thanks for taking us on this journey. Um, I think all the listeners today are really inspired by um, the, the gems and the, you know the, just the journey that you that you've gone through that you've shared and and what you want to make of Ghana and Africa and, mm -hmm. the, and the diaspora as well. I think we need to definitely, um, you know, um, there needs to really be a better balance of the economy and you know the diaspora needs to get more involved as well. Oh, as, you know the you know global brands and organizations as well, just to make something of Africa. I mean, you know, it's ripe. 
Yeah. You just need to be connected to the right people. Yeah. I always feel that, I always say this, that I feel like, you know, we're seeing what coronavirus is doing to the world, yeah. right? Um, and how, you know, journalism is now saying, how is Africa able to overcome this? Like how, you know, they're meant to be lying on the street dead. No, this is showing that's, that's you, good, man. and I say this, I feel like Africa will be the place that everybody will go back home to. Thank you. It's almost like it's, what do you what would you call it? My mentor said something to me the other day. He's got he said that Africa's gonna be Africa's gonna be the new free world. Yeah, it is. Africa is going to be the new free world. So we can sit here. Um, when people ask me, what do you think? Are you British? And I always say no, I'm not, because I can't be. I can't take in a country that doesn't accept me. Mm. You know, I don't see my That's purpose so here. Um, you know, I'm turning like. I don't see myself living here because I feel like my purpose has always been in Ghana. Yeah. You know, I could have come out here and just gone to Ghana and had fun. I actually <laughs> spent my whole entire Christmas, yeah. you know, December period, yeah. January, doing these projects because I wanted to, because I felt like I needed that to happen. Mm. So for me, um, you know, you kind of have to sacrifice a lot. I've sacrificed a lot so I can give. And that's one thing people don't understand. In order for me to say that I'm trying to change something, I have to put money into it powerful so i've i'm contributing to a lot of creatives projects and for me my fulfillment is seeing those projects come to fruition i'm seeing a fashion designer being able to create a whole line i'm seeing a um a musician being able to create an ep i'm seeing so many different things yeah. like i'm taking these things out of my own pocket because i'm saying that i want to be able to see a change in this industry yeah. it's almost like put your money where your mouth is absolutely it really is yeah it's really, really inspiring what you're trying to do. And um, yeah, I think it definitely um, warrants uh, you know, a follow-up episode in the future. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mika, just to wrap this up um, before we close the show, um, it's my custom question to all my guests. Um, so if I mention Accra to you, mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's Accra to you? So you know, what kind of thoughts, feelings, vibes, emotions come to mind when someone says Accra? Uh, Accra is home, man literally it is home even with all its faults i always say there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing there's always going to be something perfect and something that's imperfect yeah you know i appreciate a crime and it's all, all its flawness if you want to say that because it makes that country what it is you know um no one is perfect no one knows everything but i think i love to see the fact that even still the hustle and bustle of that country makes me more hungry because if I can see people come out in that 30 something degree sun and go and hustle and hawk on that street to go and feed their families, there's nothing stopping you from doing Powerful. anything that you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, despite the facts, and I always say that people will say that, oh, you're privileged just because of, you know, your family, da, 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 da. doesn't forget that. <laughs> if for myself, I'm not seeing that I want to bring change to this country, yeah. then everything that I've come from, my lineage, whatever it is, I'm doing a just, I'm not doing service to it. Because I feel like, you know, your family have fought, you know, they've been a part of this big, you know, independence and all these different things. And I want to be able to say, yeah, my grandfather did was a part of this, but this is what I continued. Yeah. So again, it goes back to when I, um, there was a question that someone asked me, I said, it's legacy. Yeah. Ooh. So when I think of Accra and I think of what essentially my family did, I think of legacy and I want to complete that legacy. Mm. Even as a female, it's very difficult for someone to come and say that, oh, women, you know, we're already women. We already have our place in society and everyone tells you this is what no, you're supposed no. to be doing. No. But do what you want. Yeah, you do what you want. But I see that. I see how hard women work in, in Ghana. I see how, you know, people really go for it. And I'm telling you, Accra is home. No matter how, look, light off or light on. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm not in the Don't UK. Sort, eh? it's, Don't it's, sort. Exactly. There's a piece. I always say this. You can be in Accra. I remember one time I was in Accra. I didn't have money. Yeah. And I was there, but I had peace of mind. Yeah, that's what it is. That is what it is. So I would say peace. And that differentiates the West from Ghana. Mm-hmm. Mika, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And um, they can find you on Instagram. Mika, is it Mika, Mika with a K? So it's Mika, M-I-K-A -I yeah. underscore Abraham on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, on Twitter, it's Mika underscore Abraham one. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and the website's coming out soon. If it's coming out soon, I just had to rebrand. But um, no yeah, so those things are coming out. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things coming out soon. So just keep up to date. We are going to be going back to Ghana. And I would definitely love, love, love if I can put this out there. Love to collaborate with so many different um, diasporans who want to come back home. Mm -hmm. 
creatives, tech, those in STEM, those in finance. I feel like there's so much we can bring and add value to. Um, I just don't feel like we we kind of, we, we all know where each other are. Absolutely. So um, yeah, let's work together. Let's reach out. I'm down for it. Absolutely. Powerful. Okay. And there you have it, guys. Um, so we'll have everything on the show notes. Once again, visit thesoundofacrowd.com. That's thesoundofacrowd.com. Uh, thanks again for listening and we'll catch you in the next one. Take yeah. care. Bye. <laughs> as well uh, please like subscribe and leave a comment below uh, if you're listening on the podcast platforms be sure to leave us a review thank you so much for listening to the sound of a cry see you next time Bye-bye.